not for the first time. They were one of the less impressive police forces that... See, I remember when I was working for David Davis, the chief constable then, Mike somebody, who then went on to take his own yeah, life. Yeah, he did, yeah. I was really impressed by him. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it all seems to have gone down. There's something cultural... There, there's something... In and in fact, the police, the chief constable Peter Fahey, who came yeah. afterwards, well, was he, he's is a impressive. listener to my show and rings in. Right, he is. He was an impressive chief constable, yeah. but there's something in the culture that is a bit strange. So when I, I had my run in with the police because I deferred their pay rise by three months, um, I had a load of abuse. I mean, you'd be amazed at how police officers feel able to use their police email addresses. Really? Oh, yeah. To send you abuse. Um, and to ring up my constituency office and leave abusive messages on the answer phone. And the... What did you do about that? Nothing. Shouldn't you have? Possibly. Um, the biggest number... What I was going to say was the biggest number were from GMP. Oops, what, did, what does that say? Should I have done something? I mean, I sort of thought that, you know, had I reported them, they would have probably been disciplined. Would it have made my life any easier? No. Don't forget, the Police Federation put me on the front of their magazine as a witch in a cartoon. <laughs> yeah, cartoon's fair game. Is it? For the Police Federation? Oh, I think secretary. you look you look at the ways that Anne Widdicombe was depicted in cartoons and she bought them all and has got them up in her loo. Um, in newspapers, yes. By a professional association? Yeah, maybe. I'm not so sure. And you can hear our full conversation by subscribing to the For The Many podcast on Global Player. And Jackie will be back from her holidays on Friday, so brand new episode, fully up to date this weekend. Now, coming up on Cross Question in just a couple of minutes' time, uh, we will be joined in the studio by Jamie Driscoll, Independent Metro Mayor of the North of Tyne Authority, Christina Patterson, the writer and broadcaster, Scarlett Maguire, Director of the polling company JL Partners, and Paul Scully, the Conservative MP for Sutton and Cheam, former business minister, former post office minister. Um, so it'd be interesting to get his take, assuming that any of you want to ask a question on the post office. I'm kind of relying on someone doing so. 0345 6060 973, text 84850, and you can watch us on Global Player. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock. The Post Office Minister has told MPs the government wants to see justice done as quickly as possible for the people wrongly convicted and fined over the Horizon accounting scandal. Kevin Hollinrake also told the Commons 64% of those affected have been paid full and final compensation. But LBC's political editor, Natasha Clark, says Alex Chalk has to decide what to do about the criminal convictions. The Justice Secretary is looking at whether he can overturn them all in one go and whether that needs to be an act of Parliament or some sort of changing of the law to do that. Because at the moment, it has to be done one by one. Yeah. I think around 100 have, have been overturned so far out of the several hundred that have been convicted. The Environment Minister says 2,000 properties are now flooded as a result of Storm Hank. Robbie Moore has been making a statement to the Commons, although Labour has criticised the government's long-term record on flood prevention. And court documents are suggesting the convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein filmed explicitly Explicit videos with some featuring Prince Andrew and Sir Richard Branson. The Duke has always strongly denied any wrongdoing, while the Virgin Founders team says Sarah Ransom's allegations are baseless and unfounded. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed up four points at 76.94. The pound will buy $1.27 and a Euro 16. LBC weather, sleet and snow showers tonight for the southwest of England and also Wales. Dry with patchy cloud elsewhere with an overnight low in some places of minus 7 degrees. From Global's Newsroom, for LBC, I'm Tim Daly. This is LBC, from Global, leading Britain's conversation, cross-question, with Ian Dale. 
Hello and a warm welcome to Monday's Cross Question with me, Ian Dale. On the panel with me tonight, we have Jamie Driscoll, Independent Metro Mayor of the North of Time Combined Authority. Uh, next to him is Scarlett Maguire, the Director for the polling company JL Partners. To my left, Christina Patterson, writer and broadcaster. And to her left, well, actually at the moment, no one because he hasn't arrived yet, but he will be here very shortly, I'm assured. Paul Scully, the Conservative MP for Sutton and Cheam, former Tech Minister and Minister for London and also Post Office Minister. Now the number to call if you'd like to put your question to our panel 0345 6060 973. You can text 84850, say Alexa, send a comment to LBC and do watch us on Global Player. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850 cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Let's go to our first caller. It's Stephen in East Grinstead. Stephen, hi. Hi, thanks, Ian. Good evening to you and your panel. If the working assumption of some Conservative MPs is to evict the Prime Minister from number 10, should a general election be held before another unelected squatter enters the building and changes all the lots? Where, where have you got this idea that Rishi Sunak is about to be ejected from number 10? Oh, I'm not saying right now, but in the next couple of weeks or months, you know, if his, his backbench MPs have had enough of him, they might, you know, send in their letters. They'd have to be clinically insane to do that. Oh, yep, sorry, I see your logic. <laughs> um, Jamie Driscoll. Well, Stephen raises a good point. You can go back to Gordon Brown. I actually have a lot of time for Gordon Brown, but he became an unelected prime minister, unelected by the, the country. Um... Boris Johnson became an unelected Prime Minister, Theresa May. Um, you go back in an, history and there are countless examples. And Yeah, and, and that, I think, is an issue that we talk about the Prime Minister almost in presidential terms, as if it's Rishi Sunak's government, as if it was Liz Truss's government, when our system is you elect your MP on their judgment, and yet the reality is, as voters... Most of us don't know our MPs. I mean, I do as a politician, but most of us don't know our MPs well enough to... We, we tend to elect a party, and that party can change direction radically as a result of changing leaders. So, you know, the implication in the question is, yeah, there's, there's actually a serious problem with our electoral system that... I mean, how, many, say, how many people we, elected Rishi Sunak? But we have a Even parliamentary system. system. We don't have a presidential We system. don't, yeah. Um, and... Yet, the Prime Minister has such a large degree of power, you could say that the Prime Minister has actually more power than the US President. You know, they can hire and fire their own cabinets. They can take us to war. And you, as the electorate, often don't even get to choose, might have even no idea who the next Prime Minister is going to be when you're voting for a party. I do think there's a big problem in democracy. I would like to see a lot more power devolved out of Westminster to, to different institutions. Well, you would, wouldn't you? Um, well, I already have. <laughs> <laughs> and it works, you know. We're, we're doing a good job. I mean, I, I would say that about other metro mayors, not independents like me as well. But you, you were elected as a Labour mayor. Mm. You, you now are not a member of the Labour Party. Um, maybe there should, be, should have been a by-election. You should have quit and fallen on your sword like he thinks um, Rishi Sunak's successful. Well, there is, yeah, and, and the people in my part of the world will get the opportunity to vote for me again on May the 2nd. Vote Jamie. Gratuitous. <laughs> you walked into that one. I did, didn't I? Um, Scarlett Maguire, um, the, the question is, let's just repeat it, uh, if Rishi Sunak is ejected from number 10, should that trigger an immediate general election? I mean, I think it'd be suicidal for Conservative MPs to even get close to trying to eject him, but that's obviously not stopped them before. So, um, I mean, it, potentially it could happen, I suppose. I, I don't know. I mean, I can see the frustration. We've now had two, I suppose, unelected prime ministers in a row, if you mean unelected by the general public. Of course, Rishi Sunak wasn't even elected by his own party members. Uh, MPs <coughs> did uh, nod him through. Uh, but I do think that, in general, we're starting to hear more and more from voters, and when I sit in focus groups, indeed, when you poll them, you know, directly for answers... Uh, there does seem to be an increasing call for a general election, regardless of whether Sunak is ejected or not. Doesn't mean to say there has to be one, though, does it? No, absolutely not. 
But but I think people have got it in their minds now that, well, if enough of us call for a general election, there will have to be one. Yeah, I mean, of course they can hold out until January 2025 if they would really like to do so. I think that would also be a mistake, especially if there does become, a sort of, if a public clamouring does sort of um, get bigger for one, because then it looks like you're running scared, which never uh, votes well for Prime Ministers. Mm. Um, Paul Scully, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, now, as you heard, the question is, Sunak is ejected from number 10, should that trigger an immediate election? Um, what's your view, given that Rishi Sunak fired you? Uh, he did, he did indeed. Uh, well spotted, but uh, no, look... Which, which I thought was incredibly unfair, given that whenever you would come on my programme, you were essentially coming... I mean, you didn't have this title, but I always called you the Minister for Sticky Wickets. <laughs> and they'd always put you up to come on the media on a difficult day because they had confidence that you could effectively do a Jeff Boycott and play a straight well, bat. I would hope it's more than just a, a Jeff Boycott. It's just actually uh, listening to the question and answering it um, in some ways rather than just giving the line. But look, I mean, Rishi's not going to go anywhere. So, uh, you know, this side of a general election... Would you like him to? I think, no. I mean, it, uh, as Scott said, it'd be mad for us to sit there and commit regicide once again uh, in this. When he's um, you know, he's got a, a, a project that he set himself with his five pledges, and I know he's only, you know, hit, you, you'll come back with me, he's only hit one of them with the inflation target, but even that one I remember this time last year, people saying, oh, well, that's going to happen on its own accord anyway. Actually, it's still a tough battle to try and get through all of those. Um, but what he's got to do, and what we've got to remember as a party, is that we've got to do the second stage. Actually, we've got to continue to deliver along those pledges, but also give a vision of the next five years. That's what people look for at a general election. What, how do I feel now But who is going to take me over the next five years to where I want to go? And we haven't done that at the moment because we're spending a lot of time tackling the, the big threats that face this country that we can see across the Europe and see across the world at the moment in terms of economic um, comeback from COVID. You know, we've shoved £408 billion pounds out of the door in COVID support. Uh, you've got to get that back somehow. So that's never going to be an easy uh, path back. Do you understand when people say, well, look, Liz Truss wasn't elected by anyone apart from a few Conservative MPs, Rishi Sunak wasn't even elected by them. If there was another change, there should be an immediate election. Well, I can, I can understand that frustration because it is a weird um, uh, form, you know, s system that we have in terms of the fact that, you know, we have a prime minister. People are used to presidential style um, systems, but it's not about a presidential style system. It's not about that one person. He is one MP. The only people that vote for Rishi Sunak uh, in, in terms of general election are the people in Richmond, Yorkshire. Um, they're voting for... The each candidate. That's just the way. I know in reality that's not what happens, but but it's it's become more and more presidential. In reality, he is one of a number of people. It's the manifesto that you buy into. Christina. I think if Rishi Sunak sneezes, we should have a general election. I think if he treads on a leaf, we should have a general election. If he has a cup of tea, we should have a general election. We should have a general election. I'm sorry, but I had to fight the urge to laugh. Although I was full of admiration, actually, when you said, Contin continue to deliver on our five pledges. I mean, what planet are you on? Uh, I, I, the, the country is absolutely sick of the Tory party. All the polls indicate that. Um, we don't know whether Labour is on for a landslide and obviously they are being very cautious and you know clinging on to the old Ming vase approach where you you know you don't dare uh, acknowledge that something is likely to happen and good luck to them I think you know that is the right approach you should never ever ever assume because Labour have after all only been in power in 33 years out of the last 100 however you just have to look at the state of the country, the state of the NHS, the state of the economy, the state of all our public services, constant strikes, just the absolute mess of it all to think we need a general election now. So I don't really care. I mean, they're not going to get rid of Rishi Sunak. They're, that They would then be even madder than we all know they are. And that is not going to happen. The people even who gave us Liz Truss know that to give us anyone else after Rishi Sunak and then say that person would be there for the general election. That is not going to happen. But we should definitely have a general election now. But you, you do understand that a, a parliament is elected for a five-year term, a government is elected for a five-year term. Yes, I term. understand. I yes. understand. And, he's and you know, who knows whether he's going to stick with his autumn promise or whether he's going to spring it on us. And if I were in his position and I really wanted to cling on to power, I can't imagine why anyone would want to be prime minister, by the way, because it is obviously a ghastly job. But... 
I understand that you're just hoping for 100 golden unicorns to come charging up and rescue you and so that things suddenly look better, but that's not going to happen either. So yes, of course, he doesn't have to have an election, but just in terms of natural justice and in rescuing and in public duty and rescuing the poor, trod downtrodden citizens of this country, a general election would be the logical thing to do. But, but, but this is not a new argument, though, is it? I remember in 1986, after the Westland crisis, Neil Kinnock was in sort of full flow, saying, demand a general election now um, I mean, sometimes you need to be careful what you wish for don't you well Brexit for example I give you that um, look we can demand for anything we like and it doesn't come our way but clearly this country is tired exhausted needs a general election let's have a little bit of fun before we go to a break follow up text not signed by anybody who would come next if Sunak is indeed ejected so let's play Game of Thrones mm -hmm. Scarlet Mm, Penny Morden. Jamie? I have no idea. Um, whoever it is, it won't make any difference to the general election. I'll come back and tell you that. Paul? Well, he's not going to be ejected. I mean, this isn't going to happen. I know, let's play the game. Well, OK, the game. Well, look, it's not going to happen this time, side of a general election, so actually it's a slightly different question or answer, should I say. I think, you know, if... Um, Rishi does go at some point, it'll probably be because he's lost a general election. In that case, I think you need a rebuilding sort of grandee, if you like. If you go down one ideologue, ideological path or another, um, then I think the people, we're going to repeat the what were happen, happened in 97, um, when actually people stopped listening to us for a good long time after that. Uh, you need someone that can actually lead the party rather than just try and read us into... Any ideas? A different idea. Not really. No. No. I mean, so that's that straight bat again. <laughs> I, genu I genuinely don't know. I genuinely so you're going yourself for. God, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm with Kemi you. I can't Bad think of well, I'm not that I don't I don't I don't want any of them, obviously, but I think she's I think she's bright, she's personable, she's uh, an independent thinker, she's competent, she's professional. I think she would be I think she'd be a, a formidable. Well, it opponent. could it could well be Kimmy Ray's not versus Penny Morden plus Sorella Brave. It could be an all female mm -hmm. contest again. Right, uh, we'll go to a little early break because the next question might take some time for them all to answer. It's uh, fourteen minutes past eight. Weekdays from 7 a.m. Why the hold up, Minister? Straight to the point. That's the reality, isn't it? Teachers are going to lose their jobs. Nick Ferrari at breakfast on LBC. Why does it take three years? I could get this done in three days. Listen on your radio and global player, the official LBC app. If you.
minutes past eight. Uh, if you just tuned in, you're listening to or watching LBC's Cross Question. With us on the panel, uh, former Business Minister and Minister for London, Paul Scully, uh, Jamie Driscoll, Independent Metro Mayor of the North of Tyne Combined Authority, which is about to be expanded, though hopefully its name will be shortened. To the North East Mayoral Combined Authority. I didn't choose it. <laughs> Why can't you just call it Mayor of Newcastle? Mayor of the North East. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly. Uh, Christina Patterson is not a mayor of anywhere. I think you'd be a fantastic mayor. <laughs> uh, writer and broadcaster. And I'll be mayor of the world, shall yeah, I? Exactly. Yeah. Well, your, your, your Twitter name is Queen Christina, <laughs> isn't it? So why not? <laughs> and uh, Scarlett Maguire is with us, director of the polling company JL Partners. Now, um, you mentioned focus groups earlier. I've never actually sat in on a focus group, and I've always wanted to. I mean, when you're sitting there listening to people pontificate, what's going through your mind? Basically, are they mad? No, no, no. I never think they're mad. I always listen very carefully. Um, I do sometimes struggle to keep a straight face, but I think that's probably more my problem than it is theirs. Um, but I think you should listen. They're really great to listen to. I think you get a much better sense of things if you're actually in... If you're I just have my own focus group every day on LBC, I suppose, yeah, don't yeah. I? But um, anyway, let's continue with another question. Uh, Chris is in Cowbridge. Chris, hello. Hi, good evening, Ian. Thank you for taking my call. What would you like to ask? Um, my question is really uh, regarding the post office mess that we're you know, we've seen such huge public outrage about, and it's specifically to do with Ed Davy. Now, considering his uh, involvement, if it's shown to be a negative uh, involvement, does that make his position as a leader of one of the parties going into a general election untenable? Now, in the face of criticism that he should have done more at the time, he was Postal Affairs Minister, which is 2010 to 2012. Lib Dem leader Sir Ed Davey said he had challenged the post office for answers, but that he and his civil servants were misled. We were reassured time and again that the Horizon system was working. We were told there weren't that many postmasters affected. We were just told so many lies, he said. Um, now, Paul Scully, you were Post Office Minister, uh, latterly, um, way, way after this time. Um, do you have any sympathy with Ed Davies' explanation? It's difficult to, to tell, to be honest, because I don't know what the landscape was exactly that he was facing at the, at the time. Uh, I do know, though, that Ed writes a lot of letters to a lot of, um, you know, points of finger at a lot of politicians and expects them to uh, do a lot of different things. And we all write in as constituency MPs, we expect ministers to ask pertinent questions, probing questions, and you don't just take what's there at face value. You really need to, to go further in, especially when um, it was clear at that time, we might not have known there were 700 odd people that were eventually getting, getting prosecuted and a couple of thousand people that were losing out financially, but we did know there were more than just one here, one there, that were being isolated by the post office. They were telling, as you saw in that drama, that excellent ITV drama, they were saying, it's only you that's affected by this. That was absolute rubbish. I was, I had the uh, advantage of taking over after the court case, which is at the end of that thing. So I, frankly, I knew it was nothing to do with me. I didn't care if it's government, post office, Fujitsu, or whoever. I can throw anybody under the bus. That's been proved to be wrong about this because it's such an egregious miscarriage of justice. And the interesting thing was, um, I remember the first time that uh, Jo in Hampshire, the po sub postmistress, she went to her MP, James Arbuthnot. Yeah who then asked around in the Commons, his, his colleagues, so look, have you got people who have gone through this as well? And of course, a lot of them had. And so he could prove that it wasn't just sort of the old one. Well, he didn't even speak to Alan Bates, so that was the thing. He actually turned down the meeting, and the one thing you do... Is that Davey? Is, is, uh, yes, said Davey, sorry, um, is actually speak to the people that are asking, and then make your mind up. If it just sounds like it's vexatious or they're just barking up the wrong tree, then that does happen. But if by not taking the meeting, I think that was a lack of judgment. But it's an interesting um, example of where, I mean, if you are in a meeting with senior people from the post office and your own senior civil servants, you, to be fair to Ed Davey, you've got to have a bit of a reason to not accept what they're saying, haven't you? Yeah, that's why I'm saying I'm not, you know, going all in saying, uh, you know, th that he's uh, totally in the wrong here because it's just very easy with hindsight a decade later to, to say all of this. I'm just saying that I think it is uh, a test of leadership to make sure you're asking the probing question and he flunked his first t test of that leadership. Christina. 
I think everybody flunked it, actually. And my understanding, Paul, is that you are quoted, I think, in the mirror as having said that Rishi Sunak um, resisted the Treasury. The Treasury, well, the Treasury. OK, well, the Treasury resisted resisted uh, the payouts. And it seems to me that nobody emerges from this absolute disgraceful and tragic situation well. I, I think... I think really, I mean, I find it a bit disgusting, actually, that it took a TV drama for everybody to point the finger and say, oh, you know, now we must investigate this and we must do this and -and so-and-so should resign, so-and-so should resign. We have all known about this scandal for years. You know, it was investigated by, was it Private Eye and and an IT magazine and then then on BBC and then there was a podcast. It has been, we have known about this for years. It has been an absolute well-known tragedy. So why is it that it takes a drama to effectively get to where we are now. Well, it, it doesn't. I mean, it, it has, has, it has, it has no, taken a drama. No, wait, no, wait, wait. No, I set up the statutory inquiry two years ago. I set up the three strands of compensation two years ago. We've been working through this. It's slow to be to delivered. No, no doubt about that. But to say we haven't done anything until now is not the case. What was interesting? I've literally left the Commons to come here, and I'm really pleased that uh, actually we had a full chamber when we heard the statement from the minister, the current post affair minister. Uh, Kevin Hollenrake, because that's what's piqued people's interest. What I think people knew, that something had gone on with the post office, but it, they didn't realise the size of it, for the same reason, they were salami slicing individuals, and MPs might have only known their constituents, they didn't know how big this was, because not everyone does read Private Eye. Well, I, I they did. may not read I Private did. Eye, but this has been in the mainstream papers yeah. for a long time, it's been on the BBC, this has not been some secret thing, and yeah. I, I'm afraid, I, again, I'm not impressed that the Commons were packed out tonight because of an IT drama, it shouldn't take an IT drama. This has been going on for a really long time, And I would really like to know, for example, when people phoned the Horizon IT support and were told you're the first person Mm. to to have raised this, which was an absolute lie. Who authorised that lie? Because I can't believe... That's that's exactly what the the post post office... That is what the post office do. I mean, otherwise we we don't run... But there's another... But who at the post office? Because, you know, that would have to come from really high up. And also there have been... um, Uh, insinuations, implications, whatever, that this came from higher, that there was government involvement now. I don't know, but obviously Royal Mail, you know, was not, it's not some, you know, tiny little high street business. So um, I... We, we do need post well, separate post office. Office. Sorry, the post office. But look, if, if there is someone in government, then, uh, you know, that'll come out of the inquiry. They haven't even given evidence yet, and so, um, and so rightly so. But, but that, I, I don't there's another it. aspect to this, which is, is, is a sideline almost, but it shows how reshuffles can be actually quite important in this sort of thing, because um, Ed Davey was succeeded by Norman Lamb, mm. who had one of the post office post office people in his constituency as one of the victims. So he knew all about this when he got the job Mm. and was starting to do things. But six months later, he was reshuffled Mm. and Joe Swinson took over over the the role. So, I mean, it's it's just an interesting example of how reshuffles, because I suspect, Mm. knowing Norman, he really would have got to grips with this because he's like a terrier when he gets his teeth into something. Mm. Uh, Jamie. Yeah, should Ed Davey resign over this? The, your job as a minister or as a mayor, you're not there to um, listen to easy answers. You're there to represent the people. And if somebody's flagging something up that, that sets alarm bells ringing, you should actually have really quite a high standard before you accept that. Now, I don't know the answers Ed Davey was given. I wasn't there. But if someone had come to me and said, look, there's this really egregious breach of the lying about it, the going in, the changing the system, I wouldn't, I would want to say, well, can you provide me evidence of that? Um, can, have you, who independently has verified this? These are the questions that any responsible minister should be asking. And it looks like, and I don't know yet, but it looks like he wasn't. Um, and that, I think, leaves him culpable. But I think there's a bigger issue here. We're all talking about, you know, taking the CBE um, off the, the, the former boss of the post office. What other miscarriages of justice are going on right now. What other uh, whistleblowers are not being listened to? Just last year we had the, the Lucy Letby, the nurse who, who murdered lots of babies. And people had said, there is something going on here. And senior managers had said, no, 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 let's close ranks. We've seen that in the police mm. with the huge numbers of sexual misconduct cases. The, the police force in my area is one of the ones who has refused to cooperate. And I think this culture 
needs to change. I think the only way we change that culture is to bring in a duty of candour. Now, that exists in a small way where you have um, serious patient incidents. But I think if that were to be put on all public officials and, you know, key public services and say, your duty when asked a question is to say what happened and why and not to narrow it to sort of slightly evasive questions and, and straight batting what you're asked by ministers or public inquiries. I think that, that culture shift is really important to prevent this happening again. It's really difficult, isn't it? Because as you say, there have been a litany of these sorts of cases where people have come forward, they haven't been believed. But Scarlett, that doesn't mean to say that no public official should be believed, because that, and that's kind of where we're heading, that anybody who's got some sort of grievance is going to come forward and expect that their case will be believed by those in authority or by those who hold those in authority to account I mean, it's, it's such a difficult balance to strike, isn't it? I think it is a hugely difficult balance to strike. But um, just on the question of Ed Davey, I mean, we had Paul and actually James well being quite reasonable and nuanced over the question of whether he should resign. Um, I think there is something slightly poetic about this question being asked of Ed Davey, is he is always the first person to call for other politicians to resign and actually often doesn't think, doesn't um, afford other politicians the courtesy, actually, that I think both Paul and Jamie have sort of offered him this evening. I think we've, we've you know, he's uh, the lead, leader of the Lib Dems, and he's presided over a time with the Liberal Democrats, where I think you can actually quite reasonably say they're not going to the country with sort of big ideas of their own or bold ideas. They are acting there as, you know, in his words, as the Tory removal service. So his whole stance is taking um, sort of principle stand against other politicians quite often. So then I think he should potentially look at his own position, bearing that in mind. But I think he was one of the people that said that uh, James Cleverley should resign I over time. I believe that, that exactly. Rehab That's what I mean. And he is always, I think, one of yeah. the first you can rely on to call on uh, anyone to resign, no matter what they've done. Paul. Do you think that the government is going to speed things up now, both in terms of the compensation and maybe to ask the public inquiry to be a little quicker? Yeah, I've lit as I say, I literally left uh, the Post Affairs Minister, uh, Kevin Holland, making his statement and what he was talking about. He was speaking to Alex Chalk, the Lord Chancellor today, who is then going to go speak to senior judiciary uh, about how you can quash convictions sort of almost blanket uh, form because at the moment you've only got about 90 odd convictions out of uh, I think it's 900 that have been um, quashed which is ridiculous because they have to go and apply themselves and people are just at the end of the tether they don't trust any authority but it's very simple isn't it? you just pass a bill through parliament well that is one of the options which that would have at. nobody voting against it exactly mm -hmm. that was literally one of the options that they're looking at and um, Kevin said he's going to come back um, probably but he'd be disappointed if it hasn't got it by the end of the week something uh, some plans in but he needs to go through that process first so yeah get that done then you need to make sure that Treasury have got the funding to give the resource to uh, the judicial to be able to do that, uh, that the post office actually crack on and get on with their very complex um, scheme, that we can, we've we got in, independent oversight on that now. Wynne Williams, I mean, it's already gone on longer than, than, than he envisaged, that I envisaged when we set up the inquiry. The reason I set it up originally to be <coughs> is so we didn't have to ha get lawyered up, as it were, as always happens in these kind of things, uh, and that you can move on um, quickly. And as it happened, it was too technical. There's lots of things that the judge said at the one of the court appeals that we then thought we needed to go to through that detail. Um, just before we go to the news, though, quick one word answer from each of you. This is a text question from Abby in Northwood. Should Paula Venels, the former chief executive of the post office, keep her CBE? Scarlett. Uh, I think she should have the grace to resign it. Can you resign a CBE? Can, well, can, you, can you hand, hand it, it, back. it back? You can. Yeah. 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 Okay. Jamie? Yes, she should hand it back, and if she doesn't, she should be taken off her. Yeah. Christina? Yeah, I agree. Paul? I agree with exactly that sentiment. It's very rare that we have unanimity on the panel, but we have it tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Right, we'll come to more of your calls and questions in just a moment. 0345 973 News headlines on LBC with Tim Daly. The government says it will look into the private prosecution system which led to 700 post office staff being wrongly convicted of fraud. The prosecutions allow some companies to bring people to court without involving police, although the post office no longer uses them. The actor Idris Elba says the government should act to ban zombie knives as quickly as they did 
with XL bully dogs. He's accused politicians of not doing enough to tackle knife crime. And a yellow weather warning for ice across the south of Wales and the southwest of England continues into tomorrow morning after freezing and snowy conditions today. 125 flood warnings remain in force as well. LBC weather, sleet and snow showers tonight for the southwest of England and Wales, dry with patchy cloud elsewhere, with a low in some areas of minus 7 degrees. LBC. is here, Conservative MP for Sutton and Cheam, Jamie Driscoll, Independent Metro Mayor of the North of Tyne Combined Authority, Christina Patterson, the writer and broadcaster, and Scarlett Maguire, Director of the polling company JL Partners. Right, let's go to a text question from Nikki in Preston, who says, do we really need to drill for more North Sea oil and gas? Can this country not survive without turning more, without burning more fossil fuels? Now, MPs are voting tonight on the oil and gas bill, which would allow for an annual licensing regime for oil and gas exploration contracts. It's been hugely controversial among the green wing of the Conservative Party. The former minister, Chris Skidmore, announced on Friday he would be stepping down as an MP as a result, and indeed he has quit his Bristol seat today. Um, now, you're going to be voting on this later, mm. Paul, I think just after 10, so we won't have that on the programme, but we are going to do a phone-in on this after uh, 9. Um, can this really be justified new oil and gas drilling contracts? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not an easy thing to tackle to to um, explain uh, in short order. But effectively, net zero is all about a transition to 2050. It's not going net zero next year or even by 2030. It's actually using each and every one of those years to make sure that we can build up our more renewable, build up our nuclear capacity as well, which uh, we've uh, let um, slip over the last decade or so, um, and have and, and make sure we can protect 100,000 jobs uh, in, in those industries. We're not having to then import a lot of uh, uh, gas, oil, and importantly for the coal license. We will be, well. because 80% of this oil and gas is going still to be less exported. So, yeah. But there's still 20%, so I mean, so less so, because I mean, it's things like when we were arguing the toss about the uh, whether the, um, the coal field in the northwest should have had a 
uh, uh, had its uh, uh, license. That's coking coal, which uh, which is needed for steel furnaces. Until we get enough electric arc furnaces, we just we we're importing that from China. So um, it is a, it is part of the process. Um, Jamie. The, these are North Sea oil contracts. Your, your area is adjacent to the North Sea. You, you, you presumably maybe have people who work in your area whose jobs depend on these sorts of things. And over the last few years, I've been working very hard on the just transition. We have um, attracted JDR cables who produce the cables that take these things offshore. We've got the, the wind turbine things being built in my area. I've put millions into training people to get these new jobs, and we have thousands of jobs in these new industries. That's the direct direction we should be taking. We cannot... Uh, what, what's particularly annoying is the lies being told around this. It's not the case that it's a fixed 20% that stays with Britain. The Rosebank oil field is going to be operated by Equinor, which is a Norwegian company. They will sell their products on the global market. A new oil and gas exploration license typically takes around 28 years before it's reaching full production. That puts us to 2052, after the net zero. But we, will, we will still, as a world, not just Britain, but we will still need oil and gas in 2052. We, I mean, it's, not as if, it's not as if there's going to be a, a 2050 an immediate transition to 100% renewables. It's, it's, ze it's not zero, need, it's net zero. No, yeah. yeah, but what we need is to reduce, massively reduce, the amount of fossil fuels being burned right now. If you look at global but production... We are. We've done better than any other European country. Yeah, but we're talking Sweden. about global production, you said, as a world. Yeah. yeah, you've got the vast amounts coming out of the Gulf, you've got what's coming out of Venezuela, you've got what's coming out of the rest of the world. We do not need to add to that. We need to reduce that. You cannot say in any sense that there is a part of getting to net zero is opening up new oil fields. There will be peak production 20 or 30 years from now. But, but the, the Green Lobby, which I include Chris Kidmore in this, they're saying, well, it's just meaningless anyway because they're, they're, uh, they're, there's so little oil and gas left in the North Sea, and yet they're creating such a row over it. It can't both be meaningless and really important. I think the... Tory policy is a mess and I think that the fact that Alok Sharma is also voting against this bill is for me an indication of the gravity of it. You look, I don't claim to be an expert in this area and I completely accept you can't suddenly turn off the switch, you know, it, this has to be a transition and it's all about how you manage that transition. But. I think the obfuscation in relation to the policy for me has been the key issue. It's a bit like Rwanda. People, the, the Rwanda policy was presented as we will send people to Rwanda for processing. No, people will be sent to Rwanda and they will not be able to come back. And that wasn't clear. And it's the same here that Rishi Sunak has said this will give us energy security. We will need gas and, uh, you know, we will need fossil fuels in the near future. And then we discovered that the vast majority of it is not coming to the UK. And as you say, Jamie, that we that uh, the Norwegian company, you know, may not give any of it to the UK. So that is, I would say, actively misleading. And all of this is relation is in relation to the recent COP we've had to global climate policy. It could not be a more serious issue. And it's about leadership. And I think we have lost our role as global leaders. I think we were doing quite a good job. I think we were quite highly respected. And now we seem to be flip-flopping all over the place. So for me, it's about clarity more than anything and about honesty. Yes, we have to manage and transition. You can't just turn the taps off, but be honest about what you're doing. Explain it to people and don't try to mislead people. Okay, Scarlett. Yeah, I mean, I think Christine is absolutely right to talk about the difficulties that's sort of happening within the Conservative Party at the moment and some of the disagreements there. But I think we can also see from some of the wranglings that the Labour Party are having and some of the questions they're leaving unanswered about um, how much money they're willing to put into a green transition, for example, uh, that there is no easy answer on this and actually it's not just as simple as saying we can you know just go to clean energy straight away and not have the need to do this i think um it's an important conversation to have either way i would say that you know it's a particularly cold snap at the moment I know, um i'm certainly worried about my energy bills that obviously come down from last year but i think last year and after you know the war in Ukraine, we saw just how important it is to have a proper sort of uh, energy security strategy in place. And I hope uh, whatever happens, we, we get But there. does this issue swing votes? Because I've always been very sceptical about this. If people are congregating down the dog and duck on a Sunday night and sort of chewing over the week's events, how many of them are going to be talking about green issues? 
I think green issues actually do matter to voters, and I think they matter to voters in different ways. Enough to swing votes. I think for some voters, the green issues are their most important voters. That tends to be more for voters on the left. Uh, we did actually see in the local elections earlier this year a certain movement from Conservative to, to Greens. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see if that happens at the general election. So for some voters, I think it is the most important thing. But actually, I think there was a warning lesson here. And no, you know, ULES was not um, a sort of... Uh, a green issue as such, it was an environmental one, but it wasn't to do with um, sort of climate change as such. Uh, but I think we actually saw the warning signs there for any politicians, again, thinking there can be easy answers on this, because actually, yes, when you poll people, they'll be very behind net zero. The country is, every demographic, every region, very pro uh, reaching net zero. However, they're feeling under such pressure from the cost of living crisis, and what they don't want is to really be paying out of pocket for it. And I think that's the part of this conversation. Right, let's move on to a very big question from David in Enfield. Hi. Hi, David. Good evening, everyone. The question is, does the panel agree with America's position tying South Africa's claim of genocide by Israel against the Gaza Palestinians? State Department spokesman recently said, <laughs> we find the submission meritless, counterproductive, completely without any basis in fact whatsoever. So in light of South Africa launching a genocide case against Israel, the US State Department has come out to declare that they are not seeing acts of genocide. And now last week on this programme, the Israeli ambassador Zippy Hotovelli suggested more or less every building in Gaza is a target. A petition to have her expelled as a result garnered over 100,000 signatures. Um, Christina. Oh, this is. Um, but there are so many tragedies around at the moment that it's hard. It's hard to say anything sensible about this war because it is just heartbreaking, and I really don't like anybody using it to score political points because this is not a, a small p political issue. It is about, well. <clears throat> 23,000 people who have died, Palestinians so far, and then it was about the terrible act, the atrocities that were committed by Hamas on the 7th of October. And both sides obviously have reason to feel deeply, deeply aggrieved, but Hamas did launch this particular war in this long-standing mm -hmm. conflict, and there are no easy answers in relation to it. In terms of genocide, I don't know what the exact technical definition of genocide is. <clears throat> I do think that what Israel is doing in Gaza is terrible. Um, I absolutely support and supported their right to respond to Hamas, and I absolutely see that they are suffering an existential threat from Hamas that has declared it wants to obliterate Israel and doesn't believe in Israel's right to exist. And if a terrorist organization have embedded themselves amongst civilian and civilian structures and have built an entire underground city of tunnels and have centers in hospitals and schools, it's extremely hard to know how you combat that. I don't know how you do that. But I too was deeply shocked by what the Israeli ambassador said last week because essentially the logic is we have to destroy the whole of Gaza mm. and the price Which is of that the point I made and that. the price of that is just far too high so uh, this is not I think actively obliterating the Palestinian people which I assume would be a definition of genocide but it certainly looks like um, just a, it is not a solution that is going to work and it is a solution that has a terrible price. Scarlett. Yeah, actually in agreement with um, Christina almost completely. And I think we are seeing that, um, that you know, that we saw this amongst the public and not just in this country, but actually in countries across the world, very high sympathy for Israel in the wake of the Hamas attacks. Their response since and uh, part of the ways they've gone about about that and their actions in Palestine is undermining that support and we're seeing that in some of what the US is now trying to you know potentially talk to them about uh, and so I think uh, they are making things very difficult for themselves and obviously for the lives of people in Gaza as well. Jamie? Quite clearly there's a case to answer. There is no doubt whatsoever that thousands of civilians are being killed. Um, we've not just had the Israeli ambassador, we've had Israeli ministers claiming that they, some of them intend to eradicate and, and clear Gaza of Palestinians. The South Africans are not the arbiters of this. They've put it to the International Criminal Court. There will be a process and investigation. If they have those concerns, as I have those concerns, they're absolutely right to be standing up and saying, can we have some justice here, please? Paul? 
Well, I, I agree with uh, a lot of what Christina said. I think Israel has the right to defend itself. I think it had to face um, the most horrible terrorist attack. Uh, the, the, everybody knew someone that had died or was, or was taken hostage at that time. However, ordinary Palestinians need to be able to lead their their life and lead a peaceful life. I'm not sure that I've heard what Jamie described with people saying they want to eradicate Gazans and Palestinians, they want to er eradicate Hamas. Mm. And actually Hamas are just as complicit in this in terms of the fact that, you know, the children that have died, they're not dying in tunnels. They are above the tunnels That's where right. the terrorists are hiding underneath them using them as shields. They're using hospitals mm. as shields. So that I'm not then excusing what happens. It's as you rightly say, it's hugely complex. How do you try and eradicate Hamas whilst that is well, that is the case without this colossal a humanitarian crisis and, and loss of life. So what the ambassador was saying was that, because I said, look, we see the television pictures every night on the news where whole areas, not just targeted buildings have been flattened, whole areas mm. have been flattened. And she was saying, yes, that's because in every other building, every other house, there was a link to a tunnel underneath. Now... I mean, uh, I've, I've not got the expertise to, to question no, no. that, but, I mean, it, it seems to me that if you are then effectively admitting, well, it isn't actually that targeted because you know that um, it, it can't be, yeah. that undermines the whole case. Which is why I think they're moving people around, to t t telling people where they're going to be bombing, but as I say, doesn't it particularly excuse it? I know um, early on when people are talking about water and electricity, um, a, a lot of that is, I think it's only 6% of the water comes from Israel. The rest of it is actually, the, the piping has all been ripped up for, um, uh, you know, for use of concrete elsewhere. The, the, the Hamas, again, have been used using that resource, uh, repurposing it for weaponry. So, again, I think both sides are, you know, not in a good place about this. I think this is where we've got to be careful about the phrase both sides. The evils committed by Hamas yeah. are not being committed by Palestinian civilians. They should not be punished for the acts okay. of evil people living amongst them. And how would you how would you get rid of Hamas then, Jamie? Well, I, I don't have the expertise to know. No, how to no, no, this and nor do I, nor do I. But but if you start saying that it's not the fault of the Palestinians and it isn't, although it also has to be said that a fair number of them do support Hamas, uh, and you know there are complex issues in this country as well with the demonstrations. Power. You know, people, friends of mine went on uh, anti. Israeli demonstrations where people were shouting from the river to the sea, which, if you are Jewish, is pretty much tantamount to saying Heil Hitler. So I do think, look, of course they shouldn't be targeting innocent Palestinians. The whole thing is an absolute horror show. But I don't think you can blithely say that Palestin Palestinians shouldn't suffer for this because Israel does have an existential threat from Hamas, and the no. question is what you do about it. No, I'm going to have to quite strongly disagree with this. If you are implying that because the Hamas have committed acts of atrocity, that it is okay to kill innocent people. I think that's just wrong. You have innocent, to find Innocent, I'm not saying, okay, but well, I'm asking you, what is the way then? Because innocent people die in wars, that is the terrible price of war. And if people, if your country, if, the, if your government unleashes a war on another country, as Russia has done in Ukraine, then unfortunately innocent people die. I am certainly saying you should do everything possible not to ensure, to minimise those deaths, and I don't think Israel has done that. Okay. But I don't think we you do can need say to that innocent okay. we do people need to don't die. Well. What we need to do is go to a break, Paul, I'm mm. afraid. It's uh, nearly ten to nine. LBC.
With us, Paul Scully, Jamie Driscoll, Christina Patterson and Scarlett Maguire. And our next question comes from Kate in Finchley, who says, Earlier you spoke about the government needing actor Toby Jones to get them to respond properly to the post office scandal. Similarly, will it now take Luther actor Idris Elba to get them to take knife crime more seriously? Now, Idris Elba is calling for the government to immediately ban the sale of so-called zombie knives and machetes, as well as more funding for youth services as part of of a campaign to tackle youth knife violence. Um, Jamie, people tend to think of knife crime as predominantly a London issue. It clearly is not. Um, is it a big issue in the North East? It's a huge issue in the North East. Um, I can think of a, a number of cases. Uh, a, a young woman, actually 15 years old, <coughs> stabbed to death in a pizza shop in the lovely rural market town of Hexham because someone else was jealous that she was going out with somebody else. Um, when I was younger, yes, there was violence when I was growing up in the rough part of Middlesbrough, but I think that level of intensity, that murderous violence, um, is a result of, of a whole range of cultural shifts. So, yes, you can ban knives, but people can get hold of knives. You can't ban kitchen knives. You know, we're, gonna, we're gonna still going to have weapons available. Um, I think part of it is the ability of the police to follow up things. Part of it, yes, is youth work. Um, but I think there's a, a deeper problem of respect, trust, uh, social isolation, all of these things are needed to happen. Um, uh, it's not an easy one to solve, but a key part of it is adequate policing resources. Scarlett. Yeah, I mean, uh, I do find knife crime quite terrifying. I think I feel like it is getting worse just anecdotally. I mean, someone was stabbed to death on my street just a year ago in northwest London, uh, something I never thought would happen sort of when I was walking along. Uh, and I think actually in that case, it was um, it was next that she'd had a restraining order against. But regardless, uh, I feel like something does need to be done because it's just very scary to live in a city where that sort of stuff is so rife that it can happen on your street. Well, when I saw this story earlier, maybe it's to my discredit, but I thought, oh, can we please have celebrities just sort of keeping out of this what 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 good does it do but the fact we're talking about it tonight which we wouldn't have done had Israel Selber not made these comments Christina yeah I think um, I think it's an excellent question by the way Kate I think and I think you're right I think it does take uh, people like Idris Elba to bring this to our conscience I live in Hackney there is an awful lot of knife crime in Hackney I'm involved with a theatre called the big house which uh, just do some coaching of young a young person there but um, which uh, uh, works with young people from the care system, um, helping them develop their artistic skills to give, dis you know, kind of other focuses of activity. And a, a, a black friend of mine was telling me the other day that her nieces and nephews are largely moving out of London <coughs> so that their young black sons will not be affected, caught up in knife crime, which I know many, many of my black friends know people who've either ended up in prison or ended up caught, in, <coughs> caught up in knife crime. It's a kind of, it's endemic and it's very complex and I've written about it a fair bit in the past and there are no easy answers but there have been schemes, for example in, um, I think in Baltimore, in the US, that have been quite successful and there was that was then replicated in Glasgow by Karen, I can't remember her surname, um, and there's been a lot of talk for years about the public health approach to knife crime, which is about you identify people at risk, you put in place all kinds of safety nets to give people the support they need to ensure that to reduce their chances of being sucked into it. But I'm afraid what the Tory government did was it massively, particularly starting off with David Cameron and George Osborne, was it basically wiped out youth services in this country. So of course these things have got worse. And we talked last week about the death of Camilla mm -hmm. Batman Gellidge and Kids Company, and it seemed to be. I mean, I think she was an extraordinary person who. Well, they threw you know, money at that. They threw money at that because they would rather throw money at a charismatic charity leader and a particular charity than at a complex infrastructure that demanded people in long term employment that would actually tackle the problem at grassroots level and more widely. It is an absolute tragedy that young boys in particular and young men in this country are living in the areas that we live in, but for them it's a war zone. And I think we should absolutely take that more seriously and if it takes Idris Elba for this government or any government to do that then so be it. Um, Paul, you briefly ran to be Mayor of London. Presumably this is a subject that you've given quite a lot of thought to. Yeah, I mean, because the war zone aspect of it, I think that's where uh, someone like Idris Elba can provide um, inspiration to, to to younger people, especially because actually once you've got the knife in, the, in your hand, it's too late. You've actually got to go back further than that 
primary school level actually rather than yeah. just secondary school to actually say look you have a, a detour here you can get a fantastic because a, a lot of it started with drugs and gangs it's gone wider than that i've got, had a stabbing in sutton uh just before christmas a, a poor young lad was uh, was killed um and, and it just starts to roll out you can either get your pair of trainers for running some drugs on county lines or whatever or you you know thinking you've got a glamorous life you do not it is really a horrendous life to choose so how do you get that earlier i think it's more than just just the funding with youth services you're always finding people harder to get insurances harder to get to v volunteers to, to to work in those areas anyway so there's more complex uh things that we need to work on but the um, talk about getting rid of zombie knives. Frankly, I already thought we had done. I was on the offensive weapons bill so committee a little well. while ago. It's, it amazes me that we're having to go back around on a very similar bit of legislation <coughs> to stop another uh, another set of knives. But there are still too many supermarkets as well. By the way, if I walk up and down Sutton as I have done with some knife, anti knife charities, just actually looking at where the knives are kept. On the uh, on the shelves, you can easily swipe them, and so it does. You need to have the education of shop shop staff as well. People are still, unfortunately, st often stabbed with their own knife. Right, let's go to our fun question at the end. We needed a bit of fun, I think, after some of the subjects we've been talking about tonight. Uh, this is from Robert. Comedian Joe Coy hosted the Golden Globes last night and bombed. Terrible jokes throughout. What is the panel's cheesiest gag? Let's have a competition. I'll be the judge. Jamie. Why did the chicken cross the playground? To get to the other slide. <laughs> yeah, that's a strong contender. <laughs> uh, Scarlet. Why do elephants paint their toenails yellow? It's to hide upside down in custard. <laughs> no, Jamie's winning. <laughs> Christina. I honestly can't think of anything except two very, very funny <laughs> stories that Scarlet told me in the green room. <laughs> She had me laughing so much. I thought I was going to laugh through that. My, whole, my whole life is so a gag. I now <laughs> can't think of any. I'm, I mean, let me think of my Christmas cracker jokes. No, I can't remember them. So apologies. Can't come up with you. One. Oh, uh, I successfully taught my dog to play the trumpet whilst on the underground. We went from barking to tooting in under two hours. <laughs> oh, that's not bad. bad. That's not bad. And Jamie wins. I think. <laughs> that is definitely the cheesiest one. My favourite joke begins with "Why did the pervert cross the road?" But unfortunately, we've run out of time. So I can't, I can't give me the punchline. You'll have to find it yourself on the internet. Uh, thank you very Prince much to, to you all. Uh, well, I didn't hear... I didn't oh, hear. dear. Did I hear what... I thought I just I Was it Prince Andrew? <laughs> yeah, allegedly. Can we get, are we covered if we say allegedly? I think we are. Right, <laughs> right thank you to Paul Scully, to Jamie Driscoll, to Christina Patterson, apart from the last few seconds, and Scarlett <laughs> Maguire. Uh, we'll have another cross-question for you tomorrow evening, starting at 8, as usual. Now, in the next hour, MPs are going to be voting on whether to pass the oil and gas... Expl is it Explanation Act bill? Something along those lines, anyway. Um, what it's going to allow is more exploration of gas and oil fields in the North Sea over the next 20 or 30 years. It's proved to be quite controversial. A Conservative MP has not only resigned the party whip, but he's actually resigned from Parliament over it. You have the uh, ex-head of COP26, Alok Sharma, uh, former Energy Secretary. He's voting against it. It's rumoured that Theresa May might as well. Uh, we're unlikely to get the result of this vote over the course of the next hour, but Ben Kentish will bring that to you after 10. But I'm wondering whether this is all a fuss about nothing or does it send the wrong signal about Britain's green credentials? On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's Newsroom at 9 o'clock, the Post Office Minister has told the Commons the government will look into the private prosecution system which led to 700 Post Office staff being wrongly convicted of fraud. Getting justice for the victims of this scandal and ensuring that such a tragedy can never happen again is my highest priority as a minister and has been throughout my 15 months in office. Kevin Hollinrake has been briefing MPs on government action over the Horizon scandal, which centred on faulty accounting computer systems. The victims were prosecuted by the post office without involving the police. Mr Hollinrake says that should be a main area of focus. Any company can bring private prosecution in this way. This is not a special power of the post office. 
I know my right honourable friend, the Lord Chancellor, wants to give this issue proper and thoughtful consideration, and I'm sure he'll report to the House about this issue in due course. A woman who says she was a victim of the sex offender Jeffrey Epstein is claiming he filmed Prince Andrew and Sir Richard Branson with women. The allegations, released by a US court, have previously been denied by the Duke, while representatives of the Virgin founder say the accuser has previously admitted inventing the tapes. LBC's US correspondent Sally Patterson says the claims go back to old statements. These documents are part of a 2015 lawsuit between Jelaine Maxwell and Virginia Dufre, who was one of her most prominent accusers here, and a US judge basically ordered for a bunch of these documents to be released. A 